Okay, welcome everyone to another live stream. Um, today's live stream um, is all about artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence revolution that we're experiencing at the moment. What I want to do in this session is really make this your session and answer as many questions about artificial intelligence as I can. Um, I basically um, had a few posts posts out over the last week on Twitter and LinkedIn to uh, ask people uh, about their key questions around artificial intelligence. And in this session, I want to answer as many of these as we can. So I've taken uh, a snapshot of the key questions people had, but I will also um, answer any life questions. So as always, please feel free to engage, comment, share, let me know where you are joining from. Uh, it's really good. Uh, Rafat, hi, welcome. Karam, good to see you. Abdullah, Chandru, uh, Pascal, really good to see you all. Hassan, Habi. So it's amazing to, to see so many people joining us in, in all these live streams that we've been doing. What we will do with these sessions is we will turn them, uh, we'll stream them to LinkedIn, obviously, but we're also streaming them to YouTube and we will turn them into a podcast episode. So if you ever want to go back and re-listen to any of them, you can just head to YouTube or to my podcast to see them. Um, so, as I said, today's session is about the, the intelligence revolution. And this is basically the title of my brand new book that has uh, come out today uh, all across the world. It came out in the UK a week ago. Now it's available um, worldwide. And in this book, I talk about how you transform your business with artificial intelligence. And I cover so many of the topics uh, that, that I will talk about here today in, in this book. So if you ever want to dive into more detail, have a look at that. So let's get this kicked off. So one of the questions, uh, one of the questions people ask a lot is what actually is artificial intelligence? And the, the ability of computers to learn and act intelligently. This was something that previously only humans could do. Now we have machines that can do this too. And this means that machines or computers can now make decisions, they can carry out tasks, and uh, they can even predict the future. And the way they're doing this is that they're using data for this. So basically we talk about algorithms. So they're basically computer programs or a formula that we say, this is how you use the data you have and turn this into insights. And I actually believe that artificial intelligence is the most transformative and the most powerful technology that humankind has ever had access to. And I believe I'm not alone in that view. Um, Google's co-founder, Sergey Brin, said that this new spring in AI is the most significant development in computing in his lifetime. And given that this included the development of the internet, this is a pretty big statement. Um, also, leaders uh, like uh, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, said that AI is the defining technology of our times. So what I recently did is I asked my 1.5 million followers on LinkedIn and said, what do you think? Uh, I did a poll and said, do you think AI is good or bad for the future of humanity? And we had uh, almost 5,000 votes. So thank you very much for all of you for voting. And 82% said, yes, it's good. And 18% said, is bad. So um the overwhelming majority thinks AI is a good thing, but obviously almost 20% think mm, maybe there's something we need to seriously worry about. And I share both of those views. I believe AI is not only the most transformative technology that humankind has ever had access to, but also um, one of the, the, the most dangerous technologies to some extent, technology that lots of people don't quite understand, that people find scary. So this is why I, I want to do this session to answer as many of your questions. So 
Um, as I say, let me know what you think in your comments. Let me know if you have any questions that you would like to have an answer to. Um, I'm just having a look through the stream and I've got people joining me from, from um, Ontario and Canada, from Nigeria, from Beirut, from the US, from Malaga and Spain. So it's amazing to see. Thank you so much for, for joining. Um, so one of the first questions that, that came up in during the discussion we've had over the last week in, in my LinkedIn feed was what is actually the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? And for me, one of the points I always make is that AI is actually nothing new. We've now had artificial intelligence for the last 50 years. Um, but we basically distinguish between two different types of AIs. One is what we refer to as an expert system, which is linked to what we call explicit knowledge, the knowledge we can easily explain and write down and transfer. So if I, th this is something you can learn from reading a book, for example, and you say, how do I spell certain words in English or in German or in Chinese? And then there you get the spelling rules and you can learn this. Or there are grammar rules and you can learn these from books. And in the past, artificial intelligence algorithms, computer programs, formulas could do this quite well. I could basically give them all the spelling rules of how to spell words and they can then correct me and highlight things that, that, that were wrong because I could easily explain those rules. Um, and but there were some limitations. So for me, translations have always been a limitation. Google Translate 10 years ago was not very good. It would be able to translate individual words, but not really individual sentences because there's lots of contextual understanding and, and nuances that we need to understand. And this for me is where machine learning comes in because it looks at tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge is knowledge that we acquire over time through experience. So how to walk, how to talk, how to ride a bike, how to recognize someone on a photograph or when we look at them. Um, these are all examples of things we acquire through experience, but we can't actually write down the rules of how we do this. So I can't write down, I can't just give a, a toddler uh, instructions of how to walk, they then take those instructions and are able to work. This is well, this is something we have to pick up over time. And this is what AI wasn't very good at in the past. But this is where machine learning comes in. So instead of programming the formula, the algorithm of a computer program saying, you take these data sets, check whether this spelling is, this word is spelled correctly or not, and then you, you come up with an answer, we now give the algorithms data and we make the algorithms learn by themselves from the data, a bit like how we learn from experience. So for me, a really good example uh, comes from Google. Google's um, um, algorithm called um, AlphaGo was developed to play the ancient game of Go. So there are certain games that we can explain the rules for and they're easily calcul calculatable. So for example, if you think about chess, chess has limited moves. I can always calculate the next possible move and artificial intelligence algorithms or computers have been able to play chess against humans for a long time. With this ancient game of Go, the challenge was that lots of the ancient Go masters would say they don't quite know why they're making certain moves. They're very intuitive moves. And therefore, this has always been a challenge for um, AI designers saying, how can we design a, a computer program that could play this? So what they did instead is instead of giving the program the rules, it gave the program all available game plays and said, OK, I give you all this data and you come up with your own algorithms of, of how to play Go. And that was interesting because this algorithm then ended up beating the world champion in Go. 
And what was even more interesting is that in one of the moves that the algorithm made, this was seen as a really poor move because all the experts, all the commentators basically gasped. They said, oh, I've never seen this move before. So this must have been a, a really big mistake. In the end, it transpired that this was the move that won the game. And um, so for me, this is a really interesting insight into where we are with AI now. And actually, the latest evolution of this alpha um, algorithm is the alpha zero algorithm, because what um, they figured out is they say, hey, we, there are still limitations. If we give the computer this ability to learn from all the previous human games, maybe there are better ways of playing this game. So how about we give them no prior knowledge and we just have the computer play against another computer indefinitely, play millions of games to see what works and what doesn't. And this is currently one of the most advanced machine learning algorithms that, that not only beats uh, Go players, but can also be applied for lots, lots of other areas to, to play chess and, and learn video games and other things. So. Hopefully this gives you an idea of the difference between AI. AI is now 50 years old. It basically means we are programming an algorithm and using data then to feed this algorithm to come up with an, with an answer. What machine learning is that we basically use the data to enable the computer to write its own algorithm and basically have this ability to learn from experience. Um, as I said, thank you so much for joining. I um, have lots of really good questions in here. I will come back to some of these. Um, one of the question is, one of the questions is how is AI actually used today, or how is AI used in everyday life? And when I sometimes talk to people about artificial intelligence, they think, okay, this is something. Um, that we might want to think about in the future. They think about robots that can completely think by themselves. Actually, AI is already used in so many parts of our lives, sometimes without us noticing it. So if we, for example, in our phones, and our, our smartphones, when you pick up your phone in the morning and you might use an Apple phone with Face ID, this whole uh, algorithm of rec of basically scanning your face and then recognizing you is enabled by artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, if you then hop onto social media and you check your Facebook feeds or your TikToks, um, again, what happens here is that this feed will be um, designed based on your what, what you've previously liked on and what those companies know about you using artificial intelligence to automate all of this. Um, YouTube is using artificial intelligence to look for videos that might violate their, their publishing policies. And they've actually just rolled out AI that is now able to remove far more videos than, than humans could ever do before. Um, if you then go into Google and you, you search for something, again, whatever is served up to you is enabled by AI because it understands what you're normally looking for, it puts it all into context. Um, we're now used to speaking to our watches and speaking to our smart speakers. So again, those voice assistants and smart speakers are enabled by AI. So there's ability of machines to understand our natural language and even speak back to us is something that is only possible with AI and machine learning. Um, we are now getting more and more smart devices. So we are now talking about this internet of things. So more smart devices connected to the internet. And um, in our homes, we're starting to fill our homes with smart devices from smart thermostats to smart light switches to smart cameras and so on. And again, they are enabled by AI. Um, if you then this is something we do less of nowadays, but if you compute, commute somewhere or you drive somewhere with your car and you use uh, Google Maps to help you guide uh, your journey, again, Google Maps uses artificial intelligence. It will look at all the movements of all the other Android phone phones that people have in their cars to determine how heavy the traffic is in real time and then give you the fastest route. And this is all done by AI. Um, if you use 
if you have a, a bank account, for example, banks and financial services firms will use AI in the background to um, look for fraud and detect potentially um, uh, fraudulent uh, transactions. Going back to cars, obviously our cars um, are full of technology nowadays, full of sensors. Um, at the moment, they help us to stay in the lane. They help us to monitor traffic flows around us. They will spot a car braking in front of us and help us not to crash into them. But in the future, they are where they will enable completely self-driving cars. And this is all, again, machine learning is instrumental to all of this. Another area where AI is used all the time is in video games from playing Fortnite to um, Grand Theft Auto to any of the, the major games. These um, are monitoring what is happening. They're making sure that people stay in the right level, that you are matched to the right uh, person so you have a really good gaming experience and so on. And then, of course, in retail, we are seeing this uh, with Amazon, where they have really powerful recommendation engines that are driven by AI or Netflix when they recommend the next movie for you. Um, they're using AI to do this. So I, I can't think of many aspects of our lives where there is no involvement of AI. So it is already with us every day. Um, I'm just looking through this stream. So um, Karim is asking a very good question here. Can I, AIs actually be creative? Um, and creativity is a very interesting um, topic because if you asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have probably said no, because um, this is something so intrinsically human. But actually, when you break this down, you can. AIs are already able to come up with creative designs. If you think about the Go example that I've just given you earlier, this you would many would argue that this was a very creative move in this game. Um, we now have AIs that can help you design new things. So whether this is a new motorcycle frame or new chair, you can basically give a computer program all the specifications of how light and how heavy and how big and, and, and all the dimensions. And then it will use artificial intelligence to come up with the right material combinations and the right designs to give you all the features and you can then uh, you can then work with the machine to pick the design that you like best and for me this is a pretty good example of ai being creative we now have artificial intelligence algorithms that can produce and write poems they can draw pictures and paintings they can write entire books though in japan there was a book that was recently nominated for a book prize that was written by an ai or um, my publisher, Kogan Page, they've just published a book that was co-written by an AI. So you think, what element of this isn't creativity? And for me, it creativity somehow means that you need to produce something new. This is definitely the case. And quite often when you combine two different things together to create something that wasn't there before. So humans have this, but machines can have that too. If you think about music, um, we now have artificial intelligence algorithms that can compose music. And music is sometimes seen as this really intrinsically human element where um, it, it touches us emotionally quite often. But then I look at the current um, charts and you think, hey, 80% of the songs were created by music executives that sit in a room and figure out what people really like in terms of beats per minute and what kind of um, topic they want to listen to in terms of the lyrics and, and so on. And actually, we can train AIs to do exactly that. And probably even better, we can train AIs to write music, completely experimental music, and then suggest this music in our Spotify playlist and then see, do we like it? Do people actually listen to it? Do they keep listening to it? So you have the entire platform of millions of users as your experimentation platform to come up with something that has, has never existed before. So there's this whole topic of creativity is something that I explore in one of my YouTube discussions with Professor Marcus Dusatoy from Oxford University. So if you want to dive into this in a bit more detail, have a look at this. This has been a, I had a really good discussion with him and he he's the author about a, a, 
he's, he's authored a book on AI and, and its ability to be creative. Um, okay, let me have a look through your stream. It's so nice to see you all there. Someone from Salt Lake City just joined, Lord uh, Fort La Lauderdale. Um, I've got someone from Helsinki and Dubai. Um, really good to see you all here. Um, let's have a look at what other questions you have. Um, Okay, so one of the questions is how how do you how how can businesses actually use AI um, in in their own operations? And for me, when I help companies understand the impact of AI, I'd like to break this down into um, three different parts. One is where you think about your um, product. So if you're a product business, think about how you can now use AI to make those products more intelligent and smarter. And we see this now in all kinds of products from toothbrushes that will give you feedback on of how well you've brushed your to uh, teeth using AI to smart toilets uh, that in the future will be able to predict uh, that you might have certain conditions by analyzing whatever you deposit into the toilet two smartwatches that we already use today that are that are now very quickly developing this ability to um, predict health conditions. So my Apple Watch can tell me that my heart rhythm is not right and I need to have this checked out. And this data and these insights simply didn't exist before. Um, the second area where organizations can use AI is to rethink their services and again, making them more intelligent, more personalized, more real time. So we see this in, in companies like Stitch Fix, that is a, a fashion subscription service and one of my favorite examples of using AI. So they will learn of what sort of clothes you like, what kind of styles you have, it will understand your size. Uh, because they, you've provided them really detailed measurements. And then the algorithm will pick outfits for you. And then um, hopefully a, a human designer will those, put those outfits together, send them to you, and you will like them. Um, we now see this in, in obviously in music streaming that's becoming increasingly intelligent where um, they create automatic playlists for you and recommendations. And obviously we see this in social media and, and platforms like TikTok that um, simply learn what you like. So if you're scrolling through your um, feed and you, watch, you keep watching something, as soon as you stop watching something, TikTok will learn from this and say, okay, you like this sort of, sort of content and then will automatically serve you more of that content. And so products, smarter products, smarter services, and then of course, smarter business processes. And this is something that lots of organizations find really important today that especially in the current economic climate where they need to make sure that their business processes are as streamlined as they can. They're now using artificial intelligence to make their robots more intelligent. They, we're now thinking about operate or automating our supply chains, be this self-driving cars, self-driving uh, ships, um, autonomous drones. Um, and all of these are no longer science fiction. So companies like Daimler are already running a fleet of self-driving trucks. Um, in Singapore, there is already a self-driving bus uh, in operation. In, in, in China, they have passenger drones that are already in operation. So the company Ehang, they are now designing a, a drone hotel that actually enables people to... Um, this hotel is on an island and you basically are picked up from the mainland by an autonomous drone that has no uh, no no pilot in it that will take you to the hotel and then you can then book drone excursions as well so there's a lot of stuff happening so for me it's about improving your product improving your services it's all about delivering a greater customer experience and then rethinking your own business operations one massive bit of advice is when companies um, think about how to use AI is that you actually approach this strategically. I find so many companies get lost or they end up running a hundred different pilot projects because they all seem exciting. For me, what you need to do is you need to think about your business, the biggest business challenges around customers, around 
processes and then think about how you can use AI intelligently to actually help with that. Okay, ah, good question from Scott here. Um, thanks for joining. Scott says, how, how can small businesses use artificial intelligence? And this is a question I get quite often. People say that actually, AI requires the latest technology, you need vast volumes of data, you need all the expertise uh, in-house to, to develop the algorithms. So is this not really um, stopping smaller organizations doing AI? And this is no longer the case because one of the things that, that one of the big trends has been is that we now have artificial intelligence as a service. So. For example, if you are a small retailer, you have your own website and you've, you've always been jealous of how Amazon uses their artificial intelligence to recommend the, the best products that you might want to buy, you can now go to Amazon, any retailer of any size and say, okay, I can I rent this algorithm? Can I run this on your platform? And you can basically use Amazon's recommendation engine for your own website. You simply pay them a monthly fee and you're up and running without any required knowledge. And this is interesting that we can now, I think lots of the barriers are breaking down at the moment. Um, companies like IBM are offering an autonomous database. So if you have your data somewhere in, a, in, in an IBM cloud server and you have applications maybe for HR, for finance, the aut autonomous database will now help you to find new insights. It will help you store your data in the right way. Um, companies like Microsoft, again, they're using their they're using AI on their own cloud servers to enable security. So for example, if you say I'm running all my um, infrastructure on, on Amazon, uh, on, on Microsoft um, cloud servers, again, Microsoft can use their own AI to monitor whether there might be any security breaches happening, because in the end, this is just pattern recognition. There are normal behaviors. And if someone suddenly starts to access private data that they've never accessed before and download some of this, this can be stopped automatically with intelligent systems. So more of this can happen and, and we, we can now hire, hire AI as a service. The other thing that is happening is that lots of products that small companies are now using are increasingly AI enabled. So I'm thinking about a the, the customer relationship management platform Salesforce, for example. If I, I'm I'm running Salesforce to make sure I I I automate some of my marketing and I automate some of my customer relationship management, Salesforce has the Einstein AI system that basically enables them to be much more intelligent. So we are now seeing this in, um, in, in, in lots of different ways where companies can simply use a service or a product that already has AI enabled. So if you're a design company and you use Autodesk as your design tool, Autodesk now has this AI enabled feature of generative design built in. Um, if you want to be better at marketing and you say, I want to find people in this area that have these needs. I can simply go to Facebook and say these are the parameters and AI will use AI to give you uh, the, the right customer contacts and, and put you ads in front of them. So more of this will happen. And because of all of this, I actually feel that smaller businesses have a real advantage here because they are not dragged down by huge leg legacy infrastructure that, that traditional businesses very often struggle with. They can be much more nimble. They can can try out new things, collect data better. And, and therefore, I think it is time for every small business to really seriously think about AI. OK, um, again, really good to see everyone on the stream from, uh, I've got uh, Tran from Vietnam just joined and saying hello, um, Savita from India. Um, Lots of people agreeing, great, disagreeing, also really good. Um, <laughs> Terry, how about raising dogs? That's a very interesting, <laughs> that's, 
that's a good question. So Terry says, ask how, how about raising dogs? Um, I, I assume you, you mean using AI to do this. What is fascinating is that there's a dog charity that has now developed um, in an algorithm that will use the camera of your phone and to monitor your dog and to see if this dog is behaving healthily. When you can then use augmented reality, again, you have your computer screen in front of you, but you have a real dog moving around in your house, um, portraying proper healthy dog behavior, then you can compare your own dog with this virtual dog to see if, if there are any differences. So this even, and that was a very good question and very random, but, but even, even raising dogs, um, AI can help with. Um, okay, uh, really good question here. What, what, which industries or sectors are leading the AI implementation? So, obviously, the the technology sectors or so companies like um, like Amazon, like Microsoft, like IBM, Facebook, um, or the Chinese equivalent of those like Tencent and Alibaba and Baidu. They are the the driving forces that really take this this whole world forward um the gaming industry is another uh, area where, where ai is used massively but it's also promising to transform uh, every aspect of business so we're seeing this now in manufacturing with industry 4.0 where it's making a real difference and also financial services is an area that i would like to highlight where they have lots of data and ai is perfect for this healthcare another really good area where i see lots of activity and potentially really transformative applications where I hope that um, AI will make healthcare much more widely available and a lot cheaper. And education, I think, is another area where I see lots of things happening, especially in China at the moment, where there are some amazing um, ed tech companies that are coming up with really amazing solutions. Um, okay. Um, that's a good question here. What 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 countries are best at, at AI? And and um, Fatih is asking a question. How would would AI potentially uh, widen the gap between countries that are at the forefront of this technology and and developing countries? So there are two very good questions here. And um, what I am seeing at the moment is that. Um, the US still is the, the main driving force in AI, but I feel that China is catching up really quickly. And I believe China is going to overtake the US in terms of their AI capabilities at some time uh, sometime soon. Um, AI has um, China has actually put in place a very big AI strategy and a very ambitious AI strategy where they said that they want to be the global leader in artificial intelligence by 2030. And another country to mention is Russia. A lot of this is quite under the radar at the moment, but President Putin actually made a, a, an inter interesting point. He basically said that artificial intelligence is the future, not only for Russia, but for all humankind. And he believes that whoever becomes the leader in this uh, sphere will become the ruler of the world. And um, so I, I see US and China at the forefront, followed by, by Russia and, the, and Europe. Um, there are certain countries in Europe, like um, the UK, Germany, and Scandinavian, and some of the Scandinavian countries, where they're making really good progress too. And the European Commission actually said that um, it, like, like in in one of their AI strategy documents, they said like like the steam engine or electricity in the past, AI is transforming our world, our society, our industry, and stakes could not be higher. And the way we approach AI will define um, the the world we live in. So all of those countries are very clear. The U uh, the UK has also just uh, established a really ambitious AI strategy and and with certain focus areas around healthcare, for example, as one of the the key areas where they want to make make a difference. Um, 
Very good. Thank you so much for all your, your lovely comments and questions. Um, there's a, a there have been so many questions here around what will AI mean for human jobs um, and and will AIs take our jobs? And for me, the, the thing is that we now have to really reflect on the capabilities of AIs. So AIs can now read, they can now write, they can write newspaper articles, they can um, debate. If I, I have a really good video on my YouTube channel on IBM's Project Debater, where I talk to, to some of the researchers of the, the Project Debater team. And basically, this is an AI that is now debating against professional debaters, where they are given a topic, they then have half an hour or so to research the topic, uh, compose their um, argument, and then present this argument to an audience, and then actually uh, argue against each other. And for me, this is something so intrinsically human, but AIs can now do this very effectively. Um, AIs can now see very well. We have machine vision. We have the ability of AIs to learn to walk in intelligent robots. So there are so many things that we now have to reflect on, say, okay, what does this mean for my own job? And what I believe AI will do is it will augment all every single job, all of our workplaces. Um, AI will transform our jobs. I don't believe that AI will destroy all of our jobs, which is sometimes the doomsday um, prediction. What AI will do, it will change all our jobs. At the same time, it will create massive amounts of jobs. So we will have new jobs in data science, in machine learning, engineering, in big data. We will have, um, so that it, it creates lots of jobs. And at the moment, quite a few studies show that currently AI is creating more new jobs than it is destroying. So that's a positive. At the same time, we all need to be aware of what AI can do. And my recommendation is to think about your own job and your own career and just reflect on this and say, OK, if AIs can now do all of these things, and I would recommend you have a look at the book to understand in a bit more detail what AI can can now do, because it, it can do now so many things that previously were, were impossible. It can now read our emotions. It can be creative. It can have a conversation. And um, and then think, what does this mean for my job? So one of the uh, example jobs I often talk about is radiologists. So I work a lot in the healthcare environment here in the UK, where we have the National Health Service, and they are currently having real difficulties recruiting radiologists because radiologists be basically people that look at um, at x-ray images and CT scans and then see, okay, is this a broken bone or not? Or they would analyze this to uh, analyze the images to detect whether someone might have uh, cancerous cells in their breast tissue, whatever it might be. And nowadays, AIs can do this better than humans. So they are better able to recognize whether a bone is, a bone is broken, whether someone has certain conditions, whether uh, someone has a precancerous cell somewhere in their body. And that's not, not a surprise because these AIs never get tired. They don't have an argument with their partner just before they go to work. They, they're not hungry. They don't get distracted by a social media message. So, and in the end, this is just pattern recognition. And this is what AIs are amazingly good at. So yes, um, we now, and, and companies that make those um, scanners like Philips are now building this technology into their products. So basically threatening the jobs of a radiologist. And therefore, one of the best paid jobs in, in the healthcare service is difficult to fill currently because people see no future. I think this is really dangerous because what AI will do, it will augment our jobs. So hopefully, it will also make our jobs more human and better because a radiologist, should this person really be spending hours on end looking at, at scans, trying to match patterns and identify whether a bone is broken or there's cancerous cells in some tissue, or should they be spending more time diagnosing 
diagnosing the exact problem, then sitting down with a patient to coming up with a unique treatment plan and personalized treatment plans for them, having those interhuman uh, moments where they really tell them what the diagnosis is and then how to, to approach this and how to handle this. And shouldn't they spend more time on researching and making this whole field of radiology better for the future? So for me, it's about thinking, okay, how will this job evolve in the future? And it will actually become more human. Some of the more human traits will become more important. And the technolo technological understanding has to be there. So we there will be more jobs working alongside machine learning algorithms to make those AIs better for the future. And I believe it, th that there is no job in the world that won't be transformed by AI. Um, even entry-level jobs or lower-skilled jobs like supermarket, checkout people and cashiers. Um, obviously, if we are really honest with ourselves, should we be spending um, as humans that have so amazing potential to change the, this world? Should we really be spending eight hours or six hours a day scanning one uh, food item after the other going beep, 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 this is not what we've been put onto this planet for, I believe. And and actually, if we think those people, if they could spend more time um, looking after their children, looking after their parents, doing worthwhile, really important things, that would make a difference. And companies like Amazon, again, are, are thinking about how AI can be used to make their customer service experience better. And in their grocery shopping, they now have these Amazon Go stores that instead of having a checkout, they just use cameras that watch what you're putting into your shopping bag. So you don't have to put it into your trolley, then go to the checkout, take it back out, scan it yourself or give it to a cashier and then put it back into the bag um, after you've paid. They just use technology. They use machine vision cameras will watch what you're t putting into your bag, what you're taking back out. Then your credit card will be automatically registered with them. They use face recognition to understand who you are. And then they will automatically take the money out of your account once you have walked out of the shop. And this for me is innovation. This is making everything easier and better. Yes, another good question here. Um, thank you. Um, is artificial intelligence dangerous? And and Penny, welcome Penny from Coventry, a very loyal um, person to my my live streams, um, is saying should people really be afraid of of what AI can do today? So, with every technology it is intrinsically neutral. So you can use AI for good, but you can also use AI for not so good things. So I believe AI has the potential to be dangerous in many different ways. Um, if you just look at how much money the US and China are spending on AI research in their military world, that is astounding. So we now, and that, that was um, the, the US, China, the UK, they all have autonomous weapons. So we now have completely autonomous drones that can take off, fly into a war theater somewhere, spot a target, identify the target and fire a rocket or fire a gun to destroy this target completely without any human interaction. So this is something I get extremely worried about. And at the moment, there are conventions that we don't allow this. So there has to be a human at the end of, a, of, of this process to decide, yes, it's okay to fire this rocket to potentially take someone's life or not. Um, even more scary, there's, uh, there was a trial by the US uh, Air Force to try a swarm of drones. So they there was a, a truck on the ground that they wanted to destroy. So that the, there was a fighter aircraft that then issued, um, let's say 50 drones, little drones that had weapons in them that would then all coordinate with each other to find this truck and, and potentially kill the driver. Um, so there's a huge scope to use this for for evil. There's the, the danger of using this for terrorism, obviously. And there's this uh, 
real danger of using artificial intelligence for social manipulation too. So we now have AIs because they can write and they can use social media. We can have completely autonomous social media bots that churn out fake news. And we've seen this in election programs where this was misused, where certain, where other countries try to influence the election results in, in, in other countries by um, bombarding them with fake news stories about certain candidates. And all of this is only going to become more problematic because at the moment, mm. some of these fake news are limited to, um, to text, but we're just seeing the emergence of uh, fake videos too. So we can now use artificial intelligence to create completely fake videos of presidents, of leaders, of business leaders, uh, making statements that can then be shared on social media. And, and this is important that we are becoming more aware of this, that our children and all of us understand that this cap capability is now there and we need to become much more critical in our consumption of news and, and especially social media. Um, <clears throat> potentially, there's obviously the, a, a, a real risk of control. Um, we are seeing this in China at the moment, where the, the Chinese government controls a lot of their systems, and they are actually introducing a social credit score scoring system using AI, where in the West we're used to social credit scores, um, we're used to financial credit scores, where our banks share our financial information with a credit scoring agency that then says you're credit worthy or not. What China is now doing is they're looking at a social credit score. So have you broken the law? Have you um, not paid your rent? Have you, are you, how much time are you spending uh, playing online games? And they're now using AI, for example, to automatically using face recognition to detect that someone might be jaywalking and this would then count against you. And the idea is that they developed this global, this, this uh, national trust score and for me, this is definitely, uh, there are some huge warning bells here that if we're starting to use this, it, it has huge scope to discriminate um, um, and, and create some social injustice. The principles are quite good. If we are trying to make our world better, we are figuring out who is a law abiding citizen. But in the future, the idea is that you then that things like if you apply for a place at the university, if you want to uh, rent a, a flat, if you want to buy a first class ticket on a train, all of this will be determined by your social credit score, which has obviously a lot of concerns. Um, again, if you want to dive more into this whole discussion around AI and the dangers of it, I have had a really good conversation with Nick Bostrom, again, a, a professor at Oxford, um, who leads the, the Futures of Humanities Institute there. And uh, you can see our discussion on my YouTube channel as well. Um, Stephanie is asking a very good question here. What checks and balances do we need to, uh, to have in place uh, for all of this? And and absolutely, we this is a really good question. And we need checks and balances. So one of the things we need is we need to have much more education around AI sessions like this, explaining what it is, what it can do, what what's good about it, what's dangerous about it. And then we need much more transparency. I believe more transparency on from businesses to explain to people how they're using data to feed their AIs and more transparency uh, around machine learning. Sometimes these machine learning algorithms are a little bit like black boxes because very similar to us, if we can't explain to someone how we are able to walk, how we are able to talk, how we are able to ride a bike, how we are able to recognize someone on a photograph, we can't explain this to anyone. And therefore, if we're now using AIs that are black boxes that also can't explain how they do it, but they do this extremely well, I think this is dangerous. And there are now lots of companies like IBM and, and, and Microsoft that are working very hard on making uh, their algorithms more transparent, more explainable to say, okay, this is actually how it works. And for me, there's, again, some real scope here that AI could make our world less biased. So for example, if 
we use a jury to decide whether someone is legible to go on patrol uh, on a parole after they've been put in prison um there are huge biases that we all carry be it racial or gender biases or social biases ais could potentially make them more transparent they can say okay we make sure that we don't have any biased data that informs our decision making so this is i think there's also a lot of hope and for me what we need is we need good regulation we need good data privacy laws but for me the key is really education telling everyone what this technology is now able to do and and by doing this and having the understanding and also the the transparency we will develop much more trust in ai um very good one question here uh from john saying have you got any any examples of ai for good you've not talked about the negative ways of using ai and and of course this is one of uh, the topics i'm probably most passionate about. And I've just written a, a Forbes article on, on AI for good and, and some practical examples. Um, and I in my book, I, I have a whole section at the end on, on how we use AI to actually make our world a better place. Because if we think about this, this is our this is the most powerful technology humans have ever had access to. If we don't use this technology to solve the world's biggest problems, then it is just such a waste. And, and we are now we're seeing this happening. So um, we've seen this in cancer sc screening, for example, where AI is now being used. Um, I believe it will make a huge difference to um, predictive and preventative healthcare that your watchers will be able to tell your your doctor in the future that something is not right and therefore you need to have, be checked out. And then AIs will predict what exactly needs to be checked. Um, we now use this for conservation. I've recently talked about a, a project that was led by IBM that looked at um, automatically spotting uh, endangered species using AI-enabled cameras or using photos that people share on social media and then recognizing where this photo was taken and then mapping those endangered species. Um, um, one of the problems that we face in the world is that the bee population is going down and bees are hugely important because they're pollinating the plants that give us our food. So if we have no bees, we won't have food. And again, we're not, there's a really good project by um, Oracle, for example, that now um, works on connected beehives that uses cameras and microphones to detect how the bee populations are behaving, whether they're healthy or not, whether they're facing a threat. So one of the threats uh, to bee uh, populations is a hornet, for example. And they can now use cameras and even sound because they can monitor the sound of the flap of a wing. And the, apparently a hornet has a different flap to bees and therefore can be identified and, and uh, beekeepers can be alerted to say, okay, there's a hornet near your bees, uh, you need to sort this out. Um, it, I also believe that AI can make our world um, more equal and help people with disabilities, for example. So one of my favorite examples is an, a free app that was de uh, developed with the help of Huawei that is uh, it's called Story Sign. So where you basically, it helps people that, um, um, that helps you to translate text into sign language. So for, for people that can't hear, um, they and they might not be able to read, but they're able to um, understand sign language. You simply point your phone onto a text and then it will use augmented reality to turn this into sign language so you can understand this. Um, climate change, another big issue around the world that we need to address. And um, what AI helps us to do is obviously it helps us to monitor and predict and calculate the impact of, of, of pollution and other factors on, on climate change. change. But it also helps us to reduce um, our en energy consumption. So companies um, like GE are now creating smart energy grids that use AI to distribute our intel 
energy more intelligently so it doesn't waste so much energy. Um, we now have smart buildings and smart um, data centers that again use artificial intelligence to optimize their operation. So uh, buildings like the, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai is the entire building is smart, is enabled by artificial intelligence to regulate heating and cooling to minimize the energy consumption. Um, then world hunger, another massive problem, and AI can help with this. It can ha help farmers predict what crop to, to plant. It can help farming become much more efficient and so on. And I, we talked about fake news as another example. Uh, AIs can not only create fake news, they can also spot this. And companies like um, Facebook and and Twitter are now using technology, AI-enabled technology, to spot fake news and highlight them. And, and this is, for me, another really good use case. So AI, obviously, for, for bad and for good, which I think is a, a really nice uh, point to stop here and all the, the beautiful things AI can do. Um, as I said, I do these live streams now every week, and um, I have a really good one coming up on Tuesday with John Thompson, who has just written a book on how to create um, analytics teams. So we will be discussing this. And next Friday, I've got um, one with Oracle. We talk about um, the how the pandemic has changed our world, has created this next normal, and how digital transformation has been fast-tracked through this process and how companies can prepare for this. So join in for this. And as always, if you want to listen to any of this again, they will be available on my podcast soon or on my YouTube channel uh, from tomorrow. So there's always time to rewatch and check out any of the other episodes. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you all so much for commenting and sharing and engaging and asking so many amazing questions. Um, as always, let me know what you think of my session. And also, I'm always keen to understand if there's any topic in particular you want me to cover in future live streams, and I will be super happy to do this. Thank you very much. Stay safe, everyone, and have a lovely week. Bye-bye.